Our scripture this morning is found in Hosea chapter 14. What, y'all thought I wasn't going to finish Hosea? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Our scripture this morning is found in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians. You know, as I began to pray what God would have me say about Thanksgiving, I knew, I knew that the concept of giving thanks was was pretty prevalent in everything that Paul wrote. And as I read through the book of Philippians, I came to understand that Philippians is a thanks sandwich, if you will. Paul begins with thanks, and he ends with thanks. And everything else in between was how we can live with this attitude of thanksgiving, because listen to me, beloved, our lives can be filled with thanksgiving. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11 In chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, in honor of reading uh, God's Word, let's all stand. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be made known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellent and if excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word. And God, we just thank you that here was this man, Paul, that that had been through so much. And for a lot of us, we would have just bailed. We would have had a bad attitude about the whole thing. But God, you, you worked in and through Paul, you spoke through him, and you flooded his soul with the spirit of thanksgiving. And so, Lord, as you illumined the heart and mind of Paul when you gave to him this perfect and infallible word, we pray, O oh God, that you would illumine our hearts and minds this morning as well. God, we love you with all of our soul. We trust you with all of our heart. And we offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer. And in through the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Master, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Obviously, this week we will uh, celebrate Thanksgiving. For a lot of people, it is a great holiday. They look forward to the meal. They look forward to the fellowship. They look forward to to everything that that Thanksgiving represents in our culture. Because I believe I could go out on a limb and everybody in this room is thankful to God for his manifold blessings. Okay? I mean... That song we just sang, Hallelujah, I'm Free, okay, 
if we don't have anything else to be thankful for, hallelujah, I'm free. And that has nothing to do with the country that I live in. It has nothing to do with whether I'm in jail or out of jail. It has nothing to do with how much money or how little money is in my bank account. It has nothing to do with anything except the redemption that the Lord Jesus Christ has brought into my life. Hallelujah, I'm free. Throughout the Bible, the concept of thanks is prevalent. In fact, 102 times in the Old Testament, the writers of the Old Testament deal with the concept of thanks. They call God's people to thanksgiving, to thanks living. The New Testament, similarly, there's 71 times in the New Testament that it speaks about thankfulness. Paul gives 46 of those instances of talking about thanksgiving. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Okay, wait. Let me find it. Here we go. Verse 7. It is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. I'm going to give thanks for that. I have you all in my heart, since both in my imprisonment... Wait, Paul, you're going to thank God for your imprisonment? Yeah, he is. Paul's going to thank God for his imprisonment. Why? Because Paul got to share the gospel with the movers and shakers of the Roman Empire because he was in prison in Rome. Now, how many of us, if we were... Now, now listen. We think prison, you know, I, I mean, modern prisons... I'm not saying I won't be there. I, I've spent a couple of nights in jail, okay? Not the most pleasant place to be. But the point that I'm trying to make, the prisons in Rome, and I just saw an article, they, they uh, uncovered one of the, the prisons in, in, in ancient Rome, and, and it was not a place you'd want to be. And Paul is saying, I thank God that God put me in prison in Rome because I'm able to share my faith with the Praetorian Guard and one day soon I'm going to stand before Caesar and I'm going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the most powerful man in all the world and I'm going to trust God whether I walk out of that room with or without my head because to live as Christ and to die as gain doesn't matter to me either way. Hallelujah, I'm free is what Paul would say. Paul could do this <laughs> because God had brought him to the point that he honestly recognized the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. Paul had come to the point, he knew, he knew, you know, when I was a young man, we were talking about uh, my best friend's mother last night. Uh, and, and my best friend, one of my best friends in high school was a, uh, a young man by the name of Kurt Huffman. And, and Kurt and I were fast and famous friends. We were in the band together. We, we spent a lot of time together. And Kurt had a little hydroplane boat, okay? And, and it was nice. I mean, this thing, it only had a 25-horsepower uh, motor on it. But, but because it was a hydroplane, you could ski behind it. And so Kurt had let me ski, and, and he was going to ski. And I said, well, let me take the boat around the, the lake, you know, one or two times so I can figure out how it handles before I'm pulling a, a skier behind me. And so I got in that boat, and you know that when I'm behind the wheel of a boat, there are two speeds, right? Dead stop and wide open, all right? And so I firewalled that thing. And, and I'm going around the lake, and... And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm making turns, just living a, 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 a great life and just having a good time. And when I came back to the shore, Kurt, all the, the color had drained from his face because at one point I'd been skipping sideways across the lake, and I thought that was cool, okay? And he said, do you realize how close you came to flipping that boat? Okay, when a, when a hydroplane moves sideways across the lake, it's about to flip, all right? And for some reason, this one didn't. So I didn't realize in the midst of it how close I was coming to disaster, okay? Paul, in living a very religious life, 
a life that was dictated and controlled by rules and regulations, he didn't realize how close he had come to losing it all, to finding himself in hell. And then one day on the way to Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and wonderfully saved him and set him free from that life of rules and regulations. And Paul just couldn't get over it. And so back in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul is saying in everything, in everything, here I am in China. I don't speak the language as well as I ought to. When I go out in public, it's pretty clear I ain't from around here. What shall I do? I know I will make cookies. In everything, give thanks. And Miss Lottie began doing what God had given to her because, listen, you show up somebody's house with cookies, they're going to let you in, right? If I showed up at your house with, with this in my hand... Or if I showed up at your house with a, a platter of cookies, which one are you more likely to let me in the front door or the back door? You going to let me in if I got cookies, all right? And God gave that to her. See, Paul says in everything, here was a man, this wasn't just words to Paul. This wasn't just lip service. He, 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 he's not just saying, here's this great philosophy for how to live life. We're going to see that throughout the, the verses that we looked at this morning, Paul is giving us whys and Paul is showing us how to do these things. Now, let me ask you a question. In everything, man, that's sometimes a challenge, isn't it? That's sometimes a challenge. We go to the doctor and he says, we found something. Well, bless God. Thank you, Lord, for whatever it is my doctor found. Because I know that you're going to bring yourself honor and glory through whatever it is this doctor has said. Maybe somebody that's close to you is, has died. Give thanks, Paul says. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Paul was not speaking, as I said a moment ago, in theory. He was speaking from personal experience. Y'all remember back from, from Acts 16, 24 through 25... Uh, it, it, it talks about where uh, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were moaning and complaining and singing, Woe is me, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. No, it says they were praying. And singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. <laughs> what do you think Paul and Silas were praying? I think the first prayer was to the guy that had locked them up in stocks. I think the next prayer was that they just did kind of a prayer walk around the room. That they looked at every other prison prisoner in the room and prayed for them. And then they began singing hymns of praise to God. How many of y'all, if you were thrown into prison, would praise God from whom all blessings flow? We wouldn't sing that. We'd be saying, I was framed. I didn't do it if somebody looked just like me. I'm innocent. But Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. We, we, y'all remember a year or so ago when Mark and, and, and Courtney were in, in, in Mexico. And one of their team members got thrown into jail. And instead of singing, woe is me, and, and saying, I'm an American. Do you not know what you're doing? He just began doing what God called him to do. He, 
he clearly remembered this verse and he began witnessing to the people that were in jail with him. And a man got saved. And they went back into that jail and began a Bible study among the prisoners. Because in everything they were given thanks. Thank you God for putting me in this prison. And in Acts 27.35, having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. Paul's life wasn't free from trouble. Paul's life wasn't free from calamity. He was shipwrecked, he was in prison, he was persecuted, he was beaten, and yet he was full of thanks in all circumstances. So when Paul says, in all things give thanks, he wasn't speaking theoretically. He was speaking of something he had actually experienced and had learned the secret to make uh, make it through and to live the victorious Christian life, to give thanks in everything even in the most awful of situations. But how did he do it? And can we do it? What was Paul's secret? Paul gives us the secret in Ephesians 5.20. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. How many of y'all lean on Romans 8.28? Man, we'll throw that one out in a New York minute, won't we? When things are going bad, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. Man, we'll throw that one out. But somehow or another, we don't quite catch the meaning of the word all. Okay? All means all. Everything. Everything. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the secret to giving thanks to God, not only in good times, but also in all times, not only for good things, but also for all things, is to give thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn back to Philippians 1.3. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. See, this sets the stage for everything else that Paul is going to say. He is telling them that he is thanking his God. Now, listen to me, beloved. A lot of people are going to sit down Thursday, and they are going to thank their God, their intelligence, their bank account, their home, their business acumen. Whatever it is, they're going to be thankful to their God. But Paul says, I am thankful to my God. He goes a completely different direction. The last two words of the verse, of you. Back in verse 1, he says who this is written to. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. And I don't know whether to take this personally or not. Including the pastor and the deacons. I mean, that's what he's saying, including the overseer and the deacons. Was there something going on with the pastor and the deacons that, you know? But he says, to all the saints in Philippi. So many in our world have tied their thankfulness to things rather than to the work and the word of God. They tie their thankfulness to circumstances. Verse 6. In verse 6, Paul says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad God's not like me? I mean, there comes a point, you know, y'all know I've got the attention span of a gnat, okay? And I'll go out and get interested in something, you know, I got interested in making candles and screen printing and and all this other stuff, and I'll do it and pursue it, and, and, and then all of a sudden I just kind of lose interest in it, and I'll have a project that's half done laying there, and it'll lay there five, six, seven years in the basement until I get tired of looking at it, and it convicting me for never finishing what a start, and I'll throw it away. Aren't you glad God's not like that? He who began a good work in you 
will perfect it. He's not just going to do a, you know, a half job. He's going to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is up to something in all of our lives, and we ought to be thankful for that. Verse 7, he shows it's not tied to his circumstances. It is only right for me to feel this way because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. Wait a minute. It is, you are in prison and you say it is right for you to feel thankful? That's exactly what Paul is saying. And then in verse 8, God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. He wants them to know that he cares about them. And then he says what he wants to happen in their life. This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Now, listen to me, beloved. When you've got words modifying other words, Paul doesn't say, I want you to have knowledge. He says, I want you to have real knowledge. I want you to have real knowledge. Back in Romans 16, 19, Paul says it this way, For the report of your obedience has reached to all, therefore I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. I won't preach on that, but you all know. Real knowledge, beloved, always comes from God and His Word. If God's Word says something and all of the world says something different, the Word of God is the one that's correct. Okay? I don't care what their tests say. I don't care what their numbers say. I don't care what their philosophers say. I don't care what their books say. If the world disagrees with the Word of God, the Word of God is the one that you stake your life upon. And i got to tell you, knowledge isn't for a secret few. You know, Brother Allen showed me the Baptist in Reflector this morning. and Concord Baptist Church is looking for a, a youth minister. It's the one in Greenville, South Carolina. We are considering legal action against them for you. No, I'm kidding. But they want a guy with a master's degree, with a seminary degree, and three years' experience, okay, to be their youth guy. And, and, and I get it, okay. I, I get what they're, what they're trying to get after. But let me tell you something, beloved. Real knowledge comes from the Word of God. I read an article this week, and, and obviously I have a master's degree. And, and this article was from Dr. Moeller, the president of Southern Seminary, and Ligon Duncan, who is the uh, president of Reform Seminary and pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi. I think he's still there. And, and, and they were talking about how the Master of Divinity degree was more crucial now than it has ever been. And, and listen, I do believe that any man that's going into the gospel ministry, if God makes a, a theological e uh, education available to him, then he ought to take it. But I also believe that as long as the man's got the ability to read the Word of God and he's got real knowledge, he's got real knowledge of the truth and a call from God, then bless God, that man's going to change the world because God is going to work through him to reach people that would never give me the time of day. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, this is good and acceptable in sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He doesn't say that he desires for all pastors to come to the knowledge of the truth or all deacons to come to the knowledge of the truth or the select few that spend all their time at the church to come to knowledge of the truth. He wants everybody that calls themselves by the name of Jesus to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in verse 10, Paul tells us the why of his prayer. So that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. When I was in the Marine Corps, we had a saying about something. Close enough for military work. You know what I'm saying? 
it'll work. All right? may not be the prettiest thing in the world, but it'll work. And we're reasonably sure that it'll come back in the same number of pieces that we send it out in. Okay? It'll work. Paul says that's not the way the church of Jesus Christ should operate. That you may approve the things that are excellent. Excellent. You know, sometimes in the church of Jesus, we settle for the mediocre. We settle for the close enough for church work. Oh, my goodness, beloved. Really close enough for church work? Close enough to lay at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ? that you may approve the things that are excellent. Now, this word sincere is, is an unusual word. Back in the, in the day that this was written, people that sold pottery, now, you know, they didn't have nice lighted displays in the stores like we do. How many of y'all remember the Brady Bunch where they, they broke the, the, the vase, mom's favorite vase, okay? And they went and got the glue, all right, and they glued that bad boy back together, and it looked just like it did when they brought it in. And then all of a sudden, Alice had gone and put, or maybe Carol had put water in the vase because there's flowers in it, and that bad boy sprung a leak, and, and them youngins started eating just as quick as they could because they wanted to get up and get away from that table before somebody figured out what had happened. Okay? So it's the same thing here. They would make this pottery, and, and maybe it wasn't perfected, and it had a crack in it. And so they would then take a little bit of wax and they would rub that wax in the crack. And you wouldn't notice it until you took that pot out in the sun and looked for it or until you got it home and and it began to leak. And so this word sincere comes from the Latin word sincera. Okay? That's where we get our English word sincere for. And it literally means without wax. Okay? Without wax. And so Paul is saying, in order for us to stand without wax and blameless until the day of Christ. In other words, we're not trying to cover something up. We're not trying to to make it look like something that we're not. You know, my notes are short this morning. And I thought it was going to be good, but here we are. And I just turned to page three. All right, let me look at it real quick. Okay, this prayer that Paul offers is is relevant for us today. Never has the need for sincere, abounding love and discernment been greater. In chapter four, Paul returns to this theme in a major way. In verses one through three, Paul asked that the church help two women who were having a strained fellowship reconcile. Aren't you glad you're not Euodia or Syntyche? Okay? I mean, your name made it into Scripture. Not because you were on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, but because you were in a fuss with somebody else in the church. All right? Bless God, I hope that my name doesn't make it in, in, into whatever record God is, is making. But anyway. So why would would Paul ask for that? Why would Paul ask for the church to get involved and help Euodia and Syntyche uh, reconcile? Because they had worked alongside Paul in ministry. They have shared in his struggle to proclaim the gospel and their names are written in the book of life. And then verses 4 through 8. That's the heart of what Paul wants to say to them. He says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Do you understand? When do we want to rejoice? When we're happy? When we have enough? When things are going well for us? But Paul says that we should rejoice always. And in verse 5, Paul is laying out for us a why. Let, excuse me, your gentle spirit be, be known to all men. The Lord is near. God inhabits the praises of his people. In the military, there comes a time when your, your, your commanding officer will call you into his office. And he will ask you if you're going to reenlist. Now, 
Lieutenant Colonel Geiger, when he called me into his office, the conversation was, Jonesy, you're not going to re-enlist, are you? Okay. And I said, well, sir, you can call me somebody with bad attitude. You can call me short. But in 45 days, you can call me long distance because I'm out of here. <laughs> and he said, sign right here. <laughs> but for God's people, for God's people, in Thanksgiving we have to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice and rejoice daily, weekly, and sometimes even hourly. Paul says to rejoice always. Verse 6. Man, really easy to say, isn't it? Be anxious for nothing. You know, I, I was over at Angie's sister's house several years ago, and, and they'd set up this thing where they were playing horseshoes. Okay, and I just happened to be sitting near the pit on one end, and somebody threw the horseshoe, and, and it landed really close to my leg, and I didn't even bat. I mean, I didn't even move. And they said, man, you got nerves of steel. And I said, no, I just really didn't see it coming. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that it was that close that it might actually be going to hit me. And so I was anxious for nothing. Listen, brother, that's easy to say, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Man, when you pour out your heart to God, when you pour everything out to God and you go to Him in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, God's going to move. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting a good part of your anxiety on him. No. Peter says cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You think Peter had gotten into, would have gotten into that mess on, on, on the crucifixion night if he had cast all his anxiety on the Lord Jesus Christ? No, he wouldn't have. Peter had learned the hard way to cast all of his anxiety on the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray about everything. Now, we use verse 7 in a lot of situations. Paul is telling us that worry pulls you apart. You don't have to fall apart. Because God will guard your emotions. You know what I've learned? When I go into someone's home and I look at their Bible and I find that their Bible is falling apart, I've come to learn that it's probably because they're not. Because their Bible is well worn. It's well used. They are living by God's Word. Worry will rob you of your joy. It borrows from the future. In verse 8, he tells us to to think on things that are praiseworthy. Think on things that are praiseworthy. Think on things that are praiseworthy. He's not just saying, you know, stiff upper lip, always, you know, be thinking of the positive. He's not taking a Norman Vincent Peale approach to this thing. What he's saying is to think on things that are praiseworthy because praise helps us get our thinking right. It is true, honest, and pure. And in the next verses, he lays out God's provision, what God has and is going to do for us, and the conclusion that we're forced to come to when we consider who God is and what God is doing is found in verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Do you understand? Do you understand me, beloved? You cannot get to 413 without doing what Paul has laid out for us in the earlier verses of this chapter. Are you in a bad situation this morning? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Are you in a good situation this morning? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Are you in the midst of a struggle? I can do all things through him who who strengthens me. Are you struggling to keep your head above the water? I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Oh, beloved, that is how we live out thanksgiving. That is how we live out thanksgiving in our lives. God knows what's going on in your life. He has a plan. He knows what you need. He just wants us to be thankful 
in all things because I can do all things through him who strengthens me.